And what's going on, everyone? Is your brother DJ Sam Rock right here on the Blaze Bible Study. And this week, we're going through Bible apologetics. We're going through the School of Evangelism because welcome back to school. School year is here and it's among us. The beginning, the first semester, I believe, is going to be the most powerful semester of your life because you're going to get these principles into your mind, into your heart, and you're going to be able to express yourself with confidence. Because remember last time we said that God has confidence in you. God has confidence in the ones that he saved, the ones that he rescued, the ones that he set forth, the one that he says, go therefore and make disciples. And the good news about it is that we don't have to know the whole entire Bible by heart. The good news is that we don't have to hold know the whole entire mind of God. The good news is that we don't have to be perfect. The good news is that we can not know everything and still be right because God is infinite and we're finite. So therefore, we don't know everything. As a matter of fact, we none of us, none of us, none of us could tell the future and we could barely remember the past. I'm going to say that again. None of us could tell the future and we barely remember the past, but God sits outside of time. He knows the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. He's infinite. We're infinite. I mean, excuse me. He's infinite. We're finite. So we have limitations. God has no limitations. Our way of thinking is not the way God thinks. His ways are not like our ways, but he did a great thing and it was grace. Remember law and grace, the law of the Lord is written on our hearts. And grace is him leading us further into what he wants us to do and wants us to say and how we should live. Tonight, we're going to be talking about, uh, is the Bible true? Because when you get back, isn't it amazing that so many books are going to be open during school, right? Books, you're going to go on the internet and research, you're going to do homework, teachers are going to be teaching math, science, you know, writing, all kind of classes are going to be going on and it's all based on books, text from books, study books, you know what I mean? Manuals and, you know, textbooks, everything is going to be opened and we're expected, everyone across the board is expected just to believe whatever we read in those books because we're going to be testing on those things. And uh, it's almost insulting to some professors, some teachers, some instructors to even question what those textbooks have to say. It could be an outdated science book about something that we have rediscovered and we have corrected yet if you're in a course that is still using that textbook you're going to be tested on those truths that are in those textbooks but whoa here we come with the bible that says it is god's word is all truth and it explains science right all in the first 10 words of the bible and we're going to talk about that after we pray Okay, so get excited because I'm excited for you. And we're just going to go through five evidences that the Bible is true. Because somebody along the way, very early, since all the books of this world are going to be open, the textbooks, science books, English studies books, social studies books, history books are going to be open, that it'll be like, don't open that Bible because that Bible is not right. That's a bunch of myths. Yet, you're going to read all these other textbooks. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for leaving us your textbook. The first text that we could ever uh, imagine that you would write is the text that you wrote in the scriptures, the Bible, basic instructions before leaving this earth. I thank you, Lord God, for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, God, I ask that you would touch every single listener right now in the name of Jesus. Give them boldness, give them love, grace, mercy, confidence to know that what you have done in their hearts and their minds is for real. And they can also express that in a loving way, a transformative way to their friends, their peers, their teachers, uh, all the faculty, school bus drivers, uh, custodians, the people in the lunchroom, and all that, that you can work a great work in love, grace, and mercy upon their lives and upon every single listener's lives. I pray for boldness, clarity right now, and I pray, Lord God, that this word, uh, this study, and these five evidences will just go deep into our hearts, and we will be more confident of who you are, what you have done, and what you have written out in your word. In the name of Jesus, I pray this by faith. And all the believers said, amen and amen. Okay, so let's just go through five and it's real quick. This will be a, a short blaze because this week I'm dedicating this time uh, for your back to school, school of evangelism. Because like I said, a lot of people are coming back 
with slogans. They're not even going to believe what they are saying. Some of them are going to be like, how could you believe in a good God that allows evil to happen in the world? That's a slogan. They don't have any, well, some of them don't have any background on that. They don't have any research. They just heard it said in an argument or something like that. And now they're going to ask the Christian the, the question. And we'll deal with that later on, Lord willing. And also, you know, when we speak like if somebody asks you a question like this, and this is a deep question, I'm going fast, but it's I'm going to take my time with a little bit with this because it's a deep and emotional, uh, to me, it's a personal question. If God is good, how can he allow babies to die? Or how could he allow babies to have disease and born with um, issues, chromosomal or uh, retardation or whatever? Now, that question, you need to be sensitive with that, especially if you know somebody who's gone through that. I've personally been through that so many times with me and my wife. But um, and I also heard the cliches. And uh, the first time I wasn't a Christian when it happened, the second time it happened, I was a Christian and it still was cliches. And it really didn't do me any good. It was insulting um, to my emotion. It was insulting to my intelligence and it was insulting overall to our family. But listen, if somebody asks you that, that's a deep question. You stop and you, you know, the first thing you should ask is, have you ever experienced that yourself? They might say yes or no, or they might know someone because it's happened so many. Listen, from the time of this recording, I've already um, heard of three babies going to heaven, like babies, one fighting for their lives for months and another uh, miscarried and another uh, found out that they were um pregnant and then there was heartbeat and no heartbeat so it's happening and i asked the question too and I, I believe that anybody with a conscience would ask the same question like why would god allow this so let's be sensitive to that if somebody asks you that because that's deep that's something that you can't just you know brush off as deep now individually we have to say we don't know why this individual baby from this individual family was allowed to have that because God, we believe God is sovereign, but we don't want to throw that in there yet. Now, if they ask you what the Bible says about it now, you know, you'll, you'll still be gentle, but the Bible does answer that issue of why sin and death and disease has entered into this world when God is an all knowing or loving God, how it came to be. And we Christians, we stand by what the word, the Bible says that people say is not true. We stand on this. You can say this, something like this. You know, I don't understand and I grieve with you um, for the fact that, you know, this does happen. It's happened in my life. You know, you probably know some people that it happened to. Uh, I don't know why, you know, individual babies and individual families get touched by this uh, thing that happens with babies. But. If you ask me what the Bible says, the Bible does address how sin, suffering, and death, and disease, and all that came about. And it's because man disobeyed God. And because of that, sin and death entered into our existence. Because the men, original man, was created perfect in a perfect garden, but with choice, with will, with this, with their will to choose. Because a loving God. Like people say, a loving, a holy God, how could a loving God or a good God allow bad things to happen? Well, this same good God that allowed bad things to happen, his original plan was not to allow anything to happen like that. But he gave, because he's a God of love, he gave us free will to choose him and to choose right over wrong. If not, we will all be all, you know, robots. Um, not having any choice at all. And that's why, biblically, sin, death, suffering has entered into our world. We were created to live forever. Man disobeyed God. And because that, we call that the fall of man. And it created the need for a savior. And that savior is Jesus. Now, I don't know how deep that would go into or penetrate somebody that's hurting that maybe that has just happened to them. But Let's remember the difference between what does the Bible say about sin, suffering, death, disease, and what do you say about it? Because what we say about it, we don't know why that happens. That's an honest answer. You, you know, you could live with that 
It's a it's an honest answer. You don't know why individual babies die or are born with disease or they suffer. Um, you know why these bad things happen to good people, so-called good people. Because remember, the Bible says that none of us are good; only God is good. But that's another thing you have to be careful with how you say that and how you phrase it. But let's go back to the five evidences that the Bible is true, because somebody inevitably is going to say. We have all these books open. You know, we could prove this in science. We could prove this in Homer and, and, you know, all that stuff that you're going to read in philosophy and all that stuff. History, we could prove this. We could prove that. Um, But we can't prove that the Bible is true and it's real and reliable. Isn't that amazing that every other historical book is less questioned than the book that we call the Bible, the Word of God. And when people look at it, it's not all fairy tale. It's all mythology. It's all this, that, and the third. It has errors in there. And, you know, when's the last time somebody um, saw an error in the textbook, questioned the professor, and then they said, whoa, we got to fix this. Nobody's going to do that. I mean, I haven't heard a story yet of somebody fixing a textbook that you're being tested in. But the Bible, there's five evidences of that is true. First of all, documentation. Documentation, meaning that yeah, we don't have the original. And God used that on purpose, I believe, because if somebody did have the original copy of the Bible, can you imagine if somebody like physically had the original? What do you think the person that had the original could do to the original copy? Think clearly now. What do you think they could do? Right. They could change it. And then no one would know whether it has been changed or not because they'll throw away the original. So God did even better. What he did was he had inspired men write down what he told them through the spirit of God to write. Right. Not only that, but there were people copying copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And you realize these scribes and these people that were copying the scriptures, if anything was wrong, they would rip up. Say there was 99, 100 pages. And on the 99th page, there was an error. Do you believe you realize that the scribe had to start all over again, like throw those papers out, start all over again, because they had to have everything lined up to the copy. Copy. They didn't have any internet. They didn't have copy machines. They couldn't fax nothing over. They couldn't photocopy nothing. So everything was by hand. Listen to the amazing thing of documentation. There's thousands of ancient hand copied documents referred to as manuscripts. And that provides proof of the New Testament and Old Testament's historical consistency. In fact, there's significantly significantly more documentation for the books of the Bible than there are for some other historically recognized authors and literature, such as Plato and the Iliad. For real. Like there's more copies of um, the scriptures than there is of Plato. And you're going to be discovering Plato if you have not already in school. And everybody's going to be like, oh, that's good. You know, that's that's true. Even though it was written, some people say thousands of years later or a thousand years later or 900 years later. And the scriptures we could date until uh, this New Testament. We could date that back to 30, 40 AD when the witnesses, eyewitnesses are still alive. And yet people say that was hundreds of years later, which is not true. And we're going around saying that every other historical book is true and the Bible is not That's number one, documentation. Number two, archaeological findings. Archaeological findings. That means, you know, excavation sites and artifacts. You know, people are digging like, you know, Indiana Jones is one of my favorite movies. He goes and he finds things. He discovers things. And then he, what does he do? He compares it to the historical uh, facts of this artifact. One of the movies, he compared it to the scriptures and what the scriptures have to say about the Holy Grail. Excavation sites and artifacts also provide evidence that many of the events, people are people and places mentioned in the Bible really existed. Other belief systems like Mormonism have places that no one has ever found. Like their Book of Mormon has mentioned places that no one has ever found. But the Bible talks about Israel, you know, the Jordan River, uh, the sea, the Dead Sea, you know, that's where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls and all that. Um, places like, you know, Nazareth, Bethlehem, um, 
the Middle East, Turkey, you know, all the, all these place, places, um, you could go there. You really can. So people and places mentioned in the Bible really existed, such as the city of Jericho and its famous walls or the Hittites, a people group once thought by skeptics to be a myth. Yet archaeologists found these places and found bones of these people. That's number two. Number three, of course, the life of Jesus. The life of Jesus. People say he never existed. Well, there's a problem with that. When somebody asks me, how do I know Jesus existed? I always ask them the same way I know George Washington existed as the first president. It's a historical fact. There were eyewitnesses. People saw him. You know, there's birth certificates somewhere around there. And there's record of him existing, of his life. Um, he wrote some of his own life. Um, people wrote about him. Same thing with Jesus. There's, <laughs> there's writings of his virgin birth, you know, events that happened around his birth, you know, the census, uh, all kinds of things were happening. Eyewitnesses, testimonies, people saw him outside um, writers of the Bible that were outside of the Bible wrote about him. Uh, people, there's evidences of, of him or eyewitnesses of him performing miracles and all that. So just as George Washington is a historical figure and he lived and we believe it, I believe the same thing about Jesus because a lot of proof and a lot of eyewitness testimony and a lot of writings in the Bible and out of the Bible, prophetic um, things that happened in the Old Testament that were prophesying about him coming. He comes on the scene and the prophecies from the Old Testament are fulfilled in the New Testament when he steps on the scene. So you have prophecy as well. Well, that's next though. So the life of Jesus, the fact that Jesus Christ, the Lord, was a true historical person is clearly documented by Jewish manuscripts, even before the Apostle Paul, you know, which was one of the great apostles that wrote a third of the New Testament. And and the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, provided their eyewitness accounts, eyewitness accounts that if you take these guys to the court of law, um, they will be great witnesses because they were eyewitnesses. They were there. Other ancient cultural documents also uh, reference his existence. For instance, the Roman leader and historian, I always get this, Tacitus wrote, this is what Tacitus wrote. He's a Roman leader and historian. Nero, this is what he wrote, quote, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, which is another a word for Christ, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. And that's mentioned by Tacitus and is also mentioned in the New Testament to verify. Both verify each other. So, why would a Roman leader and historian mention Jesus being alive and being tortured and drop names and places and drop positions if he were lying? Because what would he benefit from lying? What would the disciples benefit from lying that Jesus was alive, died, rose from the dead? They were actually going to be persecuted. Most of them got killed, right, according to Jewish history. But that's another reason. That's number three, right? So first we have documentation. Then number two, we got archaeological findings. Then number three, the life of Jesus. Number four, and this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, fulfilled prophecies. Fulfilled prophecies. The Bible contains hundreds of, even thousands of prophecies that have been fulfilled. You hear me? They've been fulfilled to a T. It includes detailed descriptions of events that will later happen to the Jewish people and surrounding nations, as well as prophecies about the life and death of Jesus Christ. The life and death. like That's like me um, reading about me when I was born. Like somebody wrote out my life. And then at, at this age, I'm like, wow, that all really happened. Then what would I have to say about that person? I would have to say that person was a prophet. That person was, you know... A prophet and a person is, you know, amazing. Well, there were prophets in the Old Testament that prophesied about Jesus being the Christ, right? 
and it came to pass how where he would be born, how he would be born, um, where he would live, how he would die, and that he would raise again, rise again from the dead. Probably people, historians and theologians say 600 to 800 years before Jesus stepped on the scene, it was a prophet Isaiah that prophesied that. Now, people say that it was all like conspiracy. People got together and formed these things. But how do you like that's me saying, hey, 800 years later, I'll add on to this. So we'll meet 800 years from now. Um, 800 years, we're all going to be gone. Um, People weren't living that long any longer after the fall of man. So they wasn't living that long. So the whole conspiracy thing that this was all about control. Yes, politically, um, the Bible was used in the Roman Empire for political reasons to control whatever um, people. But it also has the redemption message. And we're going to go. That's next. The last thing. It also has the redemption message that no other world view has. Look it up. No other world view has a redeemer like The one Christians have in Jesus. Look it up if you don't believe me. Number five, the redeemed life. Of course, the Bible speaks to the condition of the human soul. And that's why a lot of people don't like the Bible. Because it speaks directly about our human heart, our humanity, our soul. It speaks directly to the condition of the human soul in a way that has, listen to this, life-changing impact on individuals. Now, I know that's true for me, and it's true for millions and millions of people who bowed the knee to Jesus, and Jesus Christ sent his Holy Spirit, which is him again in the third person of the Holy Godhead, right, to live inside of every single person that bowed the knee, you know, asked for forgiveness, admitted that we needed a Savior, and now is born again, transforming us, renewing us from the inside out. There's no way around that. I was trying to get out of it when I when I got changed and transformed and, and saved. Believe me, I was trying to get out of it. I was like, yeah, let me let me read the Bible and make sure this is all legit. Because if it's not, if I find anything or, you know, I'm not really changing. And then I'm going to just go back because I was having a lot of fun. Right. And guess what? I couldn't find anything wrong with Jesus. I couldn't find anything wrong with the power that he put inside of me. I couldn't find a reason. I can't still explain how he changed me and how he's changing me. That was an inside job. I asked for it. That's why people say, be careful what you pray for. I asked for God to change me and he did. And now I'm stuck in a good way in this Christian walk because now uh, there's no way out because I don't want to get out. Number one, I want it out for the first two years. I want it out because I was like, this is going to be too hard. I'm going to lose all my friends. My family's going to think I'm crazy. These people are going to think I'm crazy. Now what I'm going to do, I can't be a good goody two shoes. I used to actually tell my wife, I can't be all the way Christian 100%. I was telling her that in the first you know, year that I, I started changing and God changed my life. I was changing my life. And then the next thing you know, as I kept on reading his word and getting more involved in the Christian church and, you know, studying um, his life, I started realizing that this thing of being born again is legit because I know me. You know you, right? I know me. And there were certain things that God just took the desires for me out to do what I used to do. And he took it out and exchanged it or replaced it with his desire. Don't ask me to explain that. That's a God thing. But I know for sure I'm an eyewitness. Te- uh, this is my eyewitness testimony that God did change me and he could change you too. So redeem lives is number five. The, and the Bible speaks about, you know, the life changing impact on individuals from all the cultures. And that's why people say, oh, you're just a Christian because you're in America, United States. So you heard the gospel. But how about a person in India? They'll probably be into Buddhism or they'll probably be Muslim or they'll probably be, you know, this, that and the third or Hindu. I say, OK. Uh, you know, that could be true. But why are people getting saved in India? Why are people getting saved in Russia? Why are people getting saved in the Middle East, uh, in Muslim nations? Why? If this is all cultural thing, and because where you're from, that's where you get what you're going to be. That's not true. That's not true. If that was true, then there'd be only Christians in the United States. And you know what? The devil, the enemy of our souls have deceived people who really think I've met people from the Middle East. I've met exchange students from the Middle East that are were amazed when they came over here. You know why? 
they came over here and they saw trees. You might be saying, what does it have to do with anything of this? I want to tell you right now. They saw trees with green leaves. Well, do you know all the lie, all the time that they grew up, they were told that we're a deserted, a desolate land, that we're a cursed land. And there would be no nothing, no fruitfulness in this land. And when they saw trees and they saw the beauty of this land, they were amazed and shocked. Like I had uh, an exchange student literally look at me and say, I can't believe that you guys have all these beautiful trees. I thought this was a cursed land. And also, they can't believe that we can actually have uh, you know, on a relationship with a, a living holy God. You know what? And they also thought, I'm telling you, this is, I was having a conversation with some of them. They also thought that the whole United States of America was a Christian nation. Now, you and me know that's a complete lie. There's people from all kind of cultures that live here that are not all Christian. Some, a lot of people say they're Christian, but if you look at their lifestyle for a month or so, you'll realize that they do everything the world does. And then at the end of the week, they go to church and say they're Christian. Well, we all know that's that's not true. That's not a real way of living Christianity. So we can't take this culture argument, um, you know, on us because we know that that's not true. I didn't come from a Christian family. Uh, somebody must have been Christian in my lineage, but um, I was prayed into the faith for sure because we were doing other things, um, spiritual things, but they were not Christian things. Nations and walks of life, cultures. Um, just to name a few. C.S. Lewis was a former atheist who became one of the world's most influential Christian apologists. An apologist doesn't mean that you're apologizing for being a Christian. Apologist is a person who studies and could contend or defend the reason why Christianity is true. John Newton, he was a slave, a shipmaster who converted to Christianity and later wrote the famous hymn, Amazing Grace. You know that song, Amazing Grace? He wrote that. Norma McCorvey, the woman at the heart of the U.S. Supreme Court case that resulted in nationwide legalized abortion, Roe v. Wade. She now speaks to the right of the preborn to live. Those are redeemed lives. People who were doing their own thing because they can. I tell people, you know, uh, a brother in the church was like, I had a big, you know, debate with some woman that said, you know, it's, it's okay. She could drink and she's a Christian. What do you think? I said, look, she could do whatever she wants. The Bible says we could do anything we want to do, but not everything that we want to do is going to be beneficial. Alcohol and to this very day has not proven to be beneficial in any way for anyone. Getting drunk. Well, I don't get drunk. You ever heard that? I drink, but I don't get drunk. My thing, and this is my personal conviction, what's the sense then? Why would I drink alcohol not to get drunk? If I'm thirsty, I'll just get a soda or juice, water. If I'm going to drink alcohol, it's for a reason. I want to feel the effect of the alcohol in my body. Now, people say, oh, I just get buzz. Well, buzz is past normal. <laughs> if you want to just um, drink something, you could drink non-alcoholic beverages. But when you drink alcohol... You're saying to yourself and the people around you that you want to get some kind of feeling from that alcohol. Alcohol alters our bodies. I don't know if you knew that. And there's no benefit of alcohol other than if you have a cut, maybe you could put some alcohol in the cut and maybe it will uh, disinfect a little bit of the area that you have the wound. But in internally, what does it do? It destroys a whole bunch of stuff in our system. Um, it's not meant to be in our system, number one. And number two, um, it's something that people use as an excuse. If you want to drink, you drink. So that's the whole thing when it comes to redeemed people. Redeemed lives means that what you know is right and what you do should be the same. If you do something that you know is wrong and you do it anyway, that's sin. But the redemption of Jesus, the way he redeems and transforms lives, he's going to replace those desires. Like I said earlier, you're not going to want to do that no more. And you probably won't even miss it too much after you feel the, the goodness and the, and the pleasure that God gives. And it's pure and it's true and it's holy. So let's go through the five evidences of the Bible one more time. We have documentations. We have thousands of hand copied documents. We have archaeological findings, people that are finding artifacts, evidence of uh, people, places, events that the Bible uh, endorsed. 
We have the life of Jesus, most important thing. Yes, he is alive and he's coming back. Um, they haven't found his body in the tomb because he rose from the dead. Then you have number four, fulfilled prophecies. The Bible has hundreds, even thousands of prophecies that have been fulfilled already. And the redeemed lives with those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And, and that's basically the five reasons. So you have five reasons in your belt. I don't expect you to remember all of them, but you could um, listen to this podcast over and over again so you get them. Study it out for yourself, and there's scriptures that go along with that. But if a person says, you know, the Bible is not true, you simply ask them, how do you know, and why do you why do you think that way? How do you come to that conclusion? Okay, so that's the second part of this School of Evangelists. I'm excited for you. Welcome back to school. God bless you. God keep you. And remember, God is good. Peace. <music>